Hi, I'm Philip Taylor, founder of Mad Agriculture and guest host of At the Epicenter's Regenerative Voices, Elevating Stories, Activating Change podcast. With us today is Sarah Harper, founder and CEO of Grounded Growth. Um, without further ado, let's dive into um, Sarah's mission in life, her work at Grounded Growth, and her work toward uh, global regeneration. So Sarah, uh, great to see you. Um, I've known about your work for a long time. This is the first time we've really had a chance to do an in-depth conversation. Um, I'm excited to be guest host here. Um, I'd like to just begin by asking you, you know, what is your origin story? You know, where do you come from? How are you raised? Um, how has your upbringing shaped your mission in life and your work with Grounded Growth? Great. Well, thanks for having me. It's it's great to to be on and. Um, I grew up in the middle of Kansas in a small town, uh, Beloit, Kansas, about 4,000 people. Um, I like to say wheat fields all around. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, now I'm gluten intolerant. So, <laughs> yeah. um, but both my uh, grandparents were farmers and uh, my dad uh, worked within the industry in and out. Um, and so that very much shaped, you know, kind of where I ended up. I didn't think I would be working in agriculture. Um, and it, it had a, an interesting effect because my mom's side of the family uh, were farmers that really struggled with farming. It was, it was always hard. It was always uh, hard to make it work, to make, uh, to make ends meet. And uh, the, the family, um, the, the matriarch of the family really encouraged the children to get their education and get off the farm. And they did. Um, and then my, my dad's side of the family, um, I think we're more successful in farming, um, had more of integrated, you know, crops and livestock. And um, so I, I kind of had a view of both of those, of those mm -hmm. sides. Um, and I think growing up in a, just a rural small town um, affected, you know, what I've come back to. I kind of went on an arc of exploring and living in the city and all that. And then coming back to some of the things that I, that I uh, value from, from that uh, childhood. So, um, yeah, so I think that's uh, the, the main, the main part of, of what came back to me is, you know, the, the, the roots of agriculture and, um, understanding, uh, from my parents, hearing from my parents, how hard it is. I, I never grew up thinking of farming as this romantic <laughs> thing because I, I came from families that really, you know, were, were focused on how hard, understood, had lived how hard it was. My mom's job when she was uh, young was uh, plucking the feathers off the chicken, you know, that mm -hmm. they raised and, and had for dinner. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, that's sort of where I came from and, uh, and affected, you know, my view. And then I think coming from Kansas, that center part of the country, um, and Kansas has a lot of interesting influences that kind of weave through it that I've kind of come to appreciate later. You kind of don't know what you're in the middle of until you leave it and then you look back. So I think mm -hmm. that has been great too, the wide open prairies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a question that I've wrangled with. I, I have a very similar circular, I think we all have circularity in our lives and coming home again and, and, and finding what we left to be what we're drawn to. And I, um, I'm curious just if there's any kind of high level insights from you on, you know, if it's so hard, why are you drawn back to it? You know, I think, like, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's interesting to me because I feel like it, this sounds kind of silly, maybe, but I feel like it, it almost pulled me back rather than I chose to come back because mm -hmm. um, I, I left college. Um, I got my, I was big in speech and debate, loved that, loved politics, loved policy. Um, was, was lucky enough to be able to be on a, a college team at Kansas state that was a really nationally competitive uh, team. So, you know, we got to go all over the country and it was, it was wonderful. Um, and so I left and went off to Washington DC to work on policy. And I thought, you know, policy, politics, that's going to be, you know, my life. And it, and it was for a while, but the opportunity that, that let me get in the door with, uh, with politics and policy was agriculture. <laughs> the mm -hmm. job that was open that I got my first job on Capitol Hill was a legislative correspondent for agriculture, environment, and energy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was a second education because you really learn those issues as you talk with constituents and, and craft the, the letters that the senators write back to their, to their people. So, um, 
I, I think, you know, if that opportunity had been in healthcare, maybe that's where I'd be, you know, now. Because um, I was much more, I was just interested in the overall uh, policy making and, and uh, politics more than a specific topic. And then as I moved into the agricultural side of it, which of course connected me back to my roots, and I knew that language, I knew, you know, I was comfortable in that world, seeing the policy side of it and seeing uh, all the um, challenges, frankly, that come with that. Um, and then the, getting to work on the soil carbon sequestration bill that I eventually, when I was a legislative assistant, uh, got to, got to craft that process is what began my love affair with what is now called regenerative agriculture. It mm -hmm. was initially on, um, you know, it was part of the climate change bill and it would have been a carbon offset bill and it was talked mm -hmm. about differently, but many of the same practices that we now call regenerative were, were also things that were known to store carbon, no-till farming, cover crops, right. um, livestock um, integration. So I got you know, essentially firsthand knowledge briefings from all these experts uh, in the process of crafting that bill and just really fell in love with not only the beauty of it, but um, just how wonderful it would be to have a market force that would reward this, this, these beneficial outcomes instead of always having the environment seem like a negative, like it's a negative we have to charge you for rather than a positive that, that uh, you'll be rewarded for. That's interesting. Yeah. I um, got me thinking a little bit about the, the growing climate solutions act that was just proposed by Bron Stabenow and Graham um, that sort of is reproposing um, a voluntary carbon market. So I'm curious to hear a little bit more about, your work in policy, I don't want to linger there too long, um, but if we look at the farm bill, it's such a powerful scaffold for the system that we're trying to disrupt or at least reform. Um, and I'm just curious it, what lessons were learned there. Are you still engaged in policy? Um, how has that experience kind of shaped your sort of shift toward working more with brands and consumers um, as we kind of lead up to talking a little more in depth about grounded growth? Yeah, I'm not involved in policy and I, I am not optimistic about it. <laughs> and it's because I had, you know, a front row seat um, and not just the specifics of the bill I worked on, um, but really the, the broader special interests that are involved. And, and when you say special interests, people, of course, go right to coal and oil and, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Uh, but the environmental movement is a, is a special interest too. And, um, I saw environmentalists that are now supporting regenerative agriculture oppose the carbon offset bill vigorously mm -hmm. and attack, attack carbon sequestration. You can't measure it. It's not additional. You want, you know, it's not perfect. So we have, we can't have it. Right. <laughs> and they were as much of a force in killing that. I think very positive idea as uh, the industry on the side, uh, the, 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 you know, the pro industry forces. And in fact, you know, it'd be tough to distinguish uh, between the two <laughs> in terms of the outcome they wanted. They wanted it for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I really saw was politics, especially for the people that are, that do it professionally. It's, uh, I don't want to say it's a game because it, it kind of, that kind of belittles maybe mm -hmm. what I think they're very serious about it, but um, there are all these things that the status quo depends on. It depends on a problem continuing mm -hmm. and, and then both sides getting funding to continue to fight each other on the problem. So whenever you actually solve the problem, you erode the base for both sides. You erode the people that are saying it's a problem because then they don't get as much funding. Mm -hmm. And you erode the people that are trying to protect against you know, change because it'll cut into their bottom line. So, I mean, I just, from the inside, I mean, I initially went there wanting to run for office myself. You know, that's mm -hmm. a path that many staffers take. And, uh, but, but I saw a system that, um, and, and I don't want to say, I, I don't want it to be interpreted as like our system is the worst system. I just think this is what happens with human beings. We all have different interests and our interests collide and we have to have some way to sort through them. And so I think we have, of, the, of all the systems imaginable, one of the best because it protects, at least when it's working, <laughs> it protects um, you know, minority rights and the ability to uh, it makes you have a majority, it makes you come to a consensus or else you don't get to move forward. And so that I very much appreciated, but the, these just sort of ins and outs of, of policy minutia and politics. And uh, it was very disheartening in terms of if you really want to make change. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And uh, in the meanwhile, even in my policy work, I would see um, companies come in and talk about, you know, things that they're working on. And, and, and I would watch how private business would, um, would differ from, you know, the agricultural associations that I would talk to in many cases. So that the, the private businesses would come in and maybe they were opposing, you know, legislative uh, uh, policy on the horizon, um, but they would oppose it. And, and yet they would also be working on, well, what do we do if this passes? And so then you would see if they oppose something and they'd been talking to me for months and months and maybe even a year or so about opposing it. And then it passed. And then I would notice, you know, um, within a month, they have an advertisement about how they have, how they have now brought this new great benefit to market. And, you know, on the one hand, it feels disingenuous, but on the other hand, it's smart. <laughs> Whereas, you know, most of the time from the ag associations, I would just hear, no, 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 we can't do this. We can't, we got to stop this. We got to stop this. And the way our system is set up, you can stop policy. That's the easiest thing in the world to do. I mean, a lot of people take credit for, we killed this bad thing, you know, if it weren't for us, you know, Mm-hmm. No, I mean, one senator can kill pretty much anything. Um, what's hard is to pass something. <laughs> what's hard is to, uh, to actually get something, you know, in, into law. So um, that defensiveness that I saw in agriculture, and which I understood, you know, I, ca- I came from it and I understood that, that they are such a small part of the culture and most people don't understand them and don't understand what it takes to make commercial farms work. And so they felt like, well, we need to protect, you know, this, this, uh, our ability to, to, to exist, to, to make a living. Um, but the structure of our government protected them politically, but it didn't protect, protect them. It couldn't protect them culturally mm-hmm. and, and in the marketplace. And so the rise of the natural food movement, the rise of um, organic, the rise of all these things that consumers have wanted and maybe wanted to try to force to happen through policy and couldn't, but they have just they have just galloped forward in the marketplace. I mean, the most successful part of the food industry is the natural and sustainable, quote unquote, yeah. you know, food side, uh, and that's surely market force. And so when when that market force emerges, then companies that you would have thought, especially in, even in some of the policies that they were advocating, that they were like, you know, really anti natural, anti you know, uh, holistic, anti all this stuff, they're some of the first ones to jump on and scale it up you know, because there's a market force underneath it. So Mm -hmm. I I really was impressed by, even though I would, I would rather it be a more honest, you know, a more um, uh, honest process. I was really impressed by the market's ability to, to make change um, where policy falls Mm -hmm. short. And especially because markets have an incentive to make change and policy makers often have an incentive not to. Right. And, And that's the big difference that I saw. That's fascinating. Yeah. So I think I can already uh, see and hear some of the, the off ramp logic away from the policy into grounded growth. Can you tell us a little bit about your migration from the policy work to grounded growth? I know you work with EDF. Um, you've worked with some large agribusinesses and this sort of um, uh, rising awareness around the power of markets, the power of purchasing power in consumers. Um, you know, tell me a little bit more about how you came to realize the power of that and how that's given shape to, to what grounded growth is becoming. Yeah. So when, after I left my time uh, in the Senate, um, I, I went to work for environmental defense fund and in part because um, when I was working in, on Capitol Hill, um, I, I interviewed a bunch of environmental groups about, you know, the Senator I was working for wanted to do a pro environment uh, he was a very conservative senator, so a pro-environment, pro-Republican, um, pro-market, you know, uh, ag- agenda. He wanted to lead something and not just uh, always be against things that he didn't like. And I and I really valued that. It was a great opportunity. Like that's the that's the dream as a staffer. Like you're tasked to go go find me something positive and you know that that that, that I can lead and work on. And so I interviewed a bunch of these environmental groups, and most of them were just very scoldy about. <laughs> Well, it's about time and how, you know, and you should do a lot more than even you're thinking about it. And I, let me tell you, and it, I was just shocked. I was just really like, have you no, like just personal, interpersonal sense of, of the opportunity I'm offering you here. And, uh, but Environmental Defense Fund and Nature Conservancy um, did. They, they, they were highly emotionally intelligent and, and savvy and strategic. And they brought to me this idea of soil carbon sequestration 
which led to, you know, we, we crafted uh, two bills, a domestic and international. We were incorporated into the farm bill and stripped out. It was a whole big, you know, battle and journey. And they stuck with us throughout, throughout that, uh, even though they were, <laughs> they were criticized by other environmental groups for, for working with a conservative senator, which it's <laughs> like, isn't the point to win. Don't you need some of those people? If there's somebody that's willing to actually listen to you and take a step towards you, isn't that the goal? But yeah. you know, it, it isn't, you know, as, as I learned. So, but when it came time to go, I had been so impressed with environmental defense, not only in their savvy and in, in the smarts and, um, and in their courage, frankly, you know, to, <laughs> to stick to what they had said and to support somebody that was uh, very unpopular for them and for, I'm sure for their donor base. Um, and, and they were wanting to expand that work, uh, outreach to other Republicans, outreach to farmers. And so I was part of their climate team and, and did that. And that was, that was great. It was great work. Um, eventually I evolved into consulting mm -hmm. and uh, was able to work with, continue work with EDF, but also with, as I said, some ag associations and uh, agribusinesses that um, wanted to understand, you know, not only just the climate side, but sustainability and how do they get a handle on their impact and manage it and communicate it and all, all that stuff. So I was lucky in that time to really to really kind of, you, as a consultant, you get to drop in on all these different worlds and see how they define and what, what they're struggling with. And, and then of course, hopefully help them through it. That's awesome. Yeah. I think that um, I always debate internally anyhow, to what degree you kind of work within the belly of the beast, helping the large brands reform versus sort of help the, um, the new young brands, um, out the gates that might be operating with a different set of kind of virtue. They have more elasticity and more, you know, if they build the right business model from the ground up out the gates, it becomes part of their DNA. Whereas in these large brands often struggle to reinvent themselves. Can you talk a little bit about how you've managed this sort of like reform versus revolution, working and hospicing the old and giving birth to the new, you know, how do you kind of hold that tension in your own work? And what's your appetite for working at both ends of the spectrum? Yeah, well, I mean, just personally, I, I guess I always identify, and probably a lot of people do, with the underdog, with with the new, with the revolutionary. But those people usually don't have the money to pay you. <laughs> you know? So, like, uh, working with uh, the bigger entities that are wanting to change, the the excitement there is the scale, the impact that they can make. You know, if they if they really do make a change um, and the opportunities they can open up for the emerging if, you know, if they do, you know, take that and, and um, deal with them fairly. Yeah. So, so I, you know, I learned uh, just a ton about, um, and you, you know, about change making about, I learned that in policy making too, about building coalitions and building um, diverse, you know, uh, coalitions and, and how do you, how do you, how do you give things to the other side that they need for their side? And yet, how do you, you know, make that acceptable and not make that too much of a compromise and all of that. And so that background was there. And then, and then um, going in and working more specifically with one association or one company and looking at the parameters that they are dealing with. And, you know, it was really helpful to see uh, the impact that the market was having, even on these big companies, you know, because something like, uh, Walmart making sustainability requirements that rippled through the entire, every company you can imagine now has to figure out how do we quantify these impacts because we're going to have to report them to Walmart. And if we don't, our competitors might. And it became a race to um, figure that stuff out. Yeah. And it was a market force that pushed that. It was not government. You know, if, if we were waiting for government to make everybody do a report on their environmental impact, we'd still be waiting. But Walmart could decide we, you know, we're, we just like for you to do that. And, and within a year, everybody's doing it. Everybody's figuring out what's my impact. How am I going to, well, now I figured out my impact. Well, I can't just let it sit there. Right. I have to make a goal to cut it because it's, it's a bad thing. And I can't just say, you know, so all of that change spurred by, you know, by Walmart. Now, you know, there are plenty of other bad things they spur too. So it's not, I'm not trying to just like lift them up as some, uh, perfect yeah. thing. But that's the thing. And I see it in, in regenerative agriculture too. I think the more we can get away from this black and white thinking, this, you know, it's all good or it's all bad, 
the better we are because life isn't like that. Policy isn't like that. You know, solutions aren't like that. Politics are like that. So the difference mm. between politics and policy is huge. Mm. And um, I mean, good policy, uh, <laughs> bad policy is often just politics. So, um, you know, but really when you really look at how things, um, you know, there, there are trade-offs, there are trade-offs and you have to kind of minimize the bad and then try to maximize the good, but to just deny that there's any bad in one choice and that there's all bad in another choice is, is just wrong. And if you're diagnosing the problem wrong from the beginning, of course, you're not gonna, you're mm -hmm. not gonna be able to solve it. I'm, I'm just curious before we dive in, I'm gonna eventually ask you what grounded growth is, but, but I, <laughs> uh, staying kind of deeper, I, I, how do you, you know, I, I just worry right now with us so polarized in this country, it's just so hard to have difficult conversations in the gray. Um, it's so yeah. difficult to create those containers and, and hold them where we can be transparent and vulnerable, open to change, you know, not defensive and hackles raised. Um, are you, where, where, I mean, how do you hold those conversations? You know, is that part of something that Grounded Growth does um, with your team and your clients? Is it, is it partly just how you show up as a human and your perspective or, you know, where, where are you seeing that kind of courage in society happening right now? Well, I see it in my community. That's for sure. And I think part of it is the kind of people that are drawn to work with us, you know, coming from a regenerative focus mindset on the farm side or businesses that want to Im embed that into their, into their brand. Um, that brings with it a curiosity and, uh, and I think you can't be curious and close minded at the same time. You know, it's right. just like you know, they don't go together. So that doesn't mean everybody that's curious is always warm and accepting. But mm -hmm. if you can't be interested in, you know, someone else's perspective, then, you know, you, you really can't have a difficult conversation. And I think uh, too much of, I think too much of where our society has gone or our culture has gone is toward this uh, puritanical judgment, like who gets to, who gets to judge and, and we're going to change now who's in, who's in charge of judging, you know, <laughs> as opposed to um, trying to understand or try trying to, you know, mm -hmm. come together. I mean, I see there was a farmer that, that talked about uh, that he used to look at cover crops and many different crops growing together to just cover the land, not to, not to uh, be sold as a cash crop. Uh, he used to look at his neighbors doing that and he would see competition. Competition. Like that's competition for the nutrients and the moisture that my cash crop needs. And then after he kind of shifted through the mindset, he, he now sees it. Oh no, that's synthesis. That diversity makes, mm -hmm. makes the soil better for my cash crop that comes next. And I think there's a really similar thing going on that right now, funny enough, some of the very people who, who now recognize monoculture is bad. Monoculture is all oh, we got to get rid of monoculture in their lives. They are practicing monoculture. <laughs> in their political mindset and the fact that they don't have friends from the other side, that they not only don't have friends, they think of those people as bad, as evil. Um, that's monoculture. <laughs> like when you don't have anyone in your circle of people that you interact with on a daily basis that thinks very differently than you, you're in a monoculture, you know? So. Yeah. That's um, beautifully said. I mean, I, I really love that. I've, I've recently been thinking like, you know, we always say diversity matters. <laughs> But do you really believe that? <laughs> like, no, no, that's so, so true. Because I mean, even when I worked at Environmental Defense, for example, I mean, they're very, I think, very open-minded and very market-focused. But I was, I was by far the minority, as you know, coming in as a Republican, and um, and yet they were a big part of converting me to understand the climate problem. So you know, yeah. a lot of the work that I do now is traced back to the fact that that Elizabeth Thompson and Robert Bonney at Environmental Defense Fund, you know, took the time to help educate me, to work with me, to, to meet me where I was and hopefully try to kind of bring me along. And they did. And, you know, so it's not like I'm some great success, but I've had a lot of ripples and effects on a lot of other people in circles they couldn't really influence because right. they didn't come from that kind of tribe. Um, right. But they, they did influence them through me. And I mean, like, that's what you want. You want people to, um, to be able to grow toward you or be influenced by you. But this demand that people conform and that if you don't conform, you're bad. Like, just, 
it's, 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 it's just like, it's a way to not have conversations. It's a justification for not having debate. Like debate itself is not valued. It's not acceptable even. It's, you know, if you, if you violate the orthodoxy, you're, it, it's very similar to religion. I mean, it is, if you're, if you're a heretic, you just need to be burned. That's it. You, there's no. <laughs> you don't ask the big question. Yeah. 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 yeah, so I think a lot of people don't have the hard conversations. I mean, in our community, uh, we we don't talk about politics. I mean, you know, so that that cuts a lot of that out. Um, but we do have difficult conversations about glyphosate, about mm-hmm. what's the balance between tillage and pesticides, and these are coming from people that are all across the spectrum, and we're able to have those conversations respectfully, and then perspective is able to be broadened because. You, you're talking with people that you feel you feel their goodwill from the beginning, and so another thing I think that uh, makes makes all this difficult conversation stuff worse is uh, is is digital. I mean, having a Zoom call like this, you're able to talk to each other. You know, that's different. But arguments through Twitter, I mean, that's just that's you yeah. can't tell tone, you can't tell. You dehumanize. The yes. Content. Yeah. Yeah. So. I agree. I, I, it gives me a lot of hope. I, I, I have a lot of um, all everything you're saying is is very resonant with, you know, w- one with my background personally and with the way that we're trying to work, and and I think that um, sensing the goodwill in the other, despite the differences, is such a uh, a powerful kernel of truth that um, we should all remember, you know, in our work across the aisle or people that are different than us. Um, I really like the way you said that. Um, I, I would just go back to uh, advice my speech coach, Craig Brown, Brown um, College, always gave when you're giving a speech. Uh, the audience is your friend. Mm. The audience is your friend, you know, and it's simple. But for so many people now, the audience is not their friend. Right. They're angry at the audience. And so like when you start of a place of I'm angry at the people I'm talking to, then how can you expect to get <laughs> any kind yeah, of good yeah. positive response? You know? Yeah. Now I think this is, um, you know, I was going to ask you directly sort of your theory of change and, but this is all, this is all touching on, I think the, the essence of, of how you show up, how you work with people, how you create grassroots connections at the community level that cut across differences and find common ground. Um, that human approach, that human savvy, um, I think is really honorable and um, I'm excited to hear that that's the way you're going. I think we need more of that and and less demonizing and pointing fingers and judging and more coming together. And I think in a very practical way, um, the, what you have just been describing is the, is the way that can be done. Mm-hmm. Uh, so before we go into ground growth, I just want to pause and say, um, I'm Phil Taylor, founder of Mad Ag and guest host of At the Epicenters Regenerative Voices Elevating Stories, Activating Change podcast. And with us today is Sarah Harper, founder and CEO of Grounded Growth. So Sarah, tell me about Grounded Growth. What is Grounded Growth? What's your mission? Um, How do you work and create value? And what's your sort of vision for changing the world? Uh, Yeah, Um, so we are a a very unique uh, membership network. Um, I think of it, think of it like a social network, uh, but it's private. It's only focused on, on regenerative. Um, and, uh, it is really trying to reconnect the supply chain that's been very, uh, disconnected over, over time, including consumers. And, you know, we're just actually reopening our, uh, our membership has been on pause and we're reopening it today, actually. Um, and the opportunity that we're now offering is for consumers to come in and join. We had been focusing more on farmers food companies, chefs, um, really getting at the work of, well, how do you do it? How do you grow it? How do you get it processed into an ingredient, get it into a brand? And, and, and those things we're still working on. They're all very important. But um, back to the whole discussion about the market, of course, we all know that if consumers um, really pick this up and run with it, that's the market force that, that will pull it through. I mean, consumers are already asking for essentially what regenerative is. They just haven't made the connection that regenerative can give them the things that they that they want. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's a big education process that has to go on. And, and my focus has been on working with smaller brands, pairing small brands to commercial size uh, regenerative farmers, because mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the only challenge of that is that you need a lot of small brands and a lot of small brands as we, uh, you know, they don't have a lot of money. 
they're really struggling to survive. So it's hard to get them to really step out of a lot of comfort zones. It's not even, you're not even, that's one of the challenges I feel like is that we're just, we're trying to disrupt too many things at once. (laughs) It's not just about the way the ingredients are grown. It's then about how do you get those ingredients to someone that can use them and the entire you know, agricultural commodity processing stream doesn't want a separated value added product. uh, And they certainly don't want one that, um, you know, uh, by its very existence kind of indicts (laughs) the other stuff that they, that they make their most of their money on. Um, So we have to kind of recreate a way to get it, get it through the system and, and going, going back to even home mills, you know, people milling the wheat themselves so that the farmers in our network can, mm-hmm. uh, can get their, their wheat clean to food grade clean. And some of them are even adding that capacity on the farm. And mm-hmm. then we could have them sell their wheat directly to people at home who could, with a, with a nice little mock mill, you know, sit, sitting on your counter, just like you grind your own coffee, you could grind your own wheat and use whole wheat instead of this refined white flour that's less healthy and um, it's fresh. And so the whole wheat challenge, whole grains, you know, gets solved because you, you only grind it when you need it. So you can store grain for a lot longer than you can store whole wheat flour. Yep. So um, I know it's kind of meandering, <laughs> but our mission yeah. is really to, to not just lift up regenerative as its own separate thing in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. It's really to change, to change the food system um, yeah. into something that we know consumers want, but they often uh, are either fooled or misled or are confused about how to get there, I, I think. And, and that gets into the value of certifications versus a mindset. And it's very hard, of course, to measure a mindset, but um, I think we've leaned too much on certifications. And so you, mm-hmm. have, you have this very strict list of practices that were done, but because the consumer is totally removed from the farm. It doesn't have any context of, well, what else would you do if you didn't do that? Um, Then, you know, okay, that looks good, but you know, they don't know, they don't know the context that makes you understand that that's not what they think they're getting. Glyphosate free certification to me is a perfect example of that. So you have, again, you know, environmental working group and others that raise a lot of money off of scaring the daylights out of people about glyphosate and glyphosate's not a great thing. I mean, (laughs) no fan of glyphosate, but there are a lot of other worse chemicals than glyphosate. In fact, that people moved away from to, because of glyphosate, they were able to stop using that one that stays around longer. It's more toxic, but because that's not the popular household name, the consumer is looking for glyphosate, not looking for the overall problem. And so, what we're trying to do is create, is reflect in what I see in the, in the farmers, that they are, they are curious, they are balanced, and they are continuously improving. And we want that, those ethics to, to move through the food system, the brands that we're working with, and the consumers that, that would be part of it, so that you have, that's when you have, I think, the chance to have a real impact on, on problems, because you're able to go, like many of the farmers in my network, uh, from, you're able to cut you know, your inputs by 50 and 60%. Mm -hmm. Now that's not completely input free or pesticide free, but 50 or 60% reduction. I mean, that's, that's huge. Mm -hmm. And if you had every farmer doing that, that would be so far towards solving a lot of these problems. And you compare that energy and path to, you know, this very narrow, tiny, tiny market up here that, that a few people can pay for. And a few people can, can feel good about and maybe get the very best purest food. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't have an impact on the environment because it's so tiny. You know, the scale matters when you're talking about the environment and when you're talking about, you know, um, solving some of these bigger problems. Yeah, I think there's something interesting there too around sort of food access and providing better food produced in better ways at the same cost or near the same cost where if you're helping the farmer improve their bottom line versus their top line, then they can actually make money by saving versus make money by, you know, asking more. I think in reality, you know, both probably need to happen. I think food is actually probably too cheap and doesn't, you know, um, reflect all the externalities, you know, so to speak of its production. And at the same time, like there are very clearly big gains to be had from 
um, you know, saving from input costs and those sorts of things. So I, I'm curious, um, it sounds like, I mean, what I like about your platform and your approach is you have like an education platform, which is really meant, it sounds like you're actually opening it up to consumers. And so you've got videos and curriculum and mm -hmm. insights that sort of bring the consumer up to speed, the brands up to speed. And then in tandem, you have this um, sort of process by which you're rebuilding the food system. And so um, I'm curious to hear more about your case study with uh, Bella Gluten Free, Around the World Gourmet, and your farmer Justin, and how you sort of facilitated that ecosystem of change, how you facilitated it, um, how were the connections made, how are the relationships managed? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's such a success that moves those ideals into practice. And I think that's what we're all looking for is, you know, there's a lot of great talk out there, but how do you walk it? How do you have the boldness, the courage? How do you make the money work and the value get created across the supply shed so everyone's happy? So I'm just curious to hear a little bit about how you are actualizing your vision um, with, with those partners. Yeah. So, you know, it started off uh, with an in-person meeting with the farmers and, uh, and the brands. And um, this is the very beginning when I was exploring whether to launch Grounded Growth and uh, to see if there was something, something that we could do, that, you know, a niche we could fill. And um, hearing Justin Knopf, who's, uh, our, who's our director of agriculture, as well as, you know, the farmer in the case study, um, hearing him talk and explain to uh, these brands who initially wanted organic, they wanted to find and work with organic farmer. And Justin was explaining that, you know, he's done no-till for, you know, for 10 years and that it, if he went to organic, he would have to till up uh, his land and he would lose the carbon and that the carbon was more important to him. So really, you know, even though he could understand why people would want organic, that for where he's at in his farm, that to do that would be not only an environmental step backward, but it would, it, it would, he would lose soil fertility uh, over time. And so um, the, the sort of eye-opening pop that I saw on the brands, because they'd never heard anything remotely close to that. You know, of course, there's no concept of tillage. I mean, they're starting to be now, but there's no concept of these different things that aren't already known, you know, like organic. And organic has kind of come to mean perfect for a lot of people in a lot of people's minds. Mm -hmm. So um, just having that process go on and, it, you know, that was the beginning of the relationship too, where they could kind of see through each other's uh, eyes. And, and like we talked about, that sense the goodwill. You know, the conversation started not from a place of, well, why aren't you organic? And it, and it, and Justin didn't respond with, well, I'll tell you, you'll never make me organic. You know, it didn't, you know, it just started from a totally different place of mm. we'd really like to work together. We'd, you know, the farmer would really like to escape having mm. to be just in the commodity stream. The brand would really like to be able to trace their product back to a farmer that's doing good things. So that's where it started. And then from there we built on, well, how do we, how do we get there? And it was very hard of course, to get, his product and he's a wheat grower and they're, you know, belly gluten free and around the world gourmet are gluten free brands. So the challenges of getting that all uh, perfected were too much. <laughs> but what we did realize we could do is look, these brands could still help him expand his regenerative journey and they could get the credit for that because they could have their consumers help pay to do it. And so both of those brands committed 1% of their net sales for a year. And that money ended up helping to help helping Justin to pay for, uh, five species cover crop that he planted in one field and he'd never done that before. And so he got to, he got to take that risk without having to pay for it all himself. Mm -hmm. And then the learning that happened, um, they saw, he saw such a benefit. He was able to reduce the amount of pesticide he used, the land absorbed water better. And it was so such good outcome that his brother and his dad, who he farms with saw how great that was. And they've expanded the practice, you know, onto their acreage too. So you've got, what they paid for was one field, a 72 acre field, but the impact they made was across a 4,000 acre farm. That's awesome. Because they, they helped him take that risk to step forward. And um, really in a similar, idea. yeah, well, well, I mean, it, it's, it's also what comes from having a farmer in the mix and helping to create the project. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's Justin's idea that, you know, one of the things that is so hard for farmers is, is that first step, because you, you put so much at risk you know, that you, yeah. that you don't know you'll get back the, the expense of the seeds, the, you know, what's it going to do? Is it going to take up too much of my moisture? Is it, you know, all this stuff. And so to even have a partner come alongside you and help pay that risk, pay for that initial risk 
um, you know, it's huge. It's and then, and then the, the brands, you know, their consumers are part of that, are part of making that change happen. Yeah. I, I love to the, um, it's a great kind of stepping stone model too, because many brands that I interact with want to know how to change their sourcing. Right. And that's just so difficult to do. Yeah. You know, if you have a gluten-free product that you need to have assurance that it's gluten-free and grown in these ways and meets these specifications, if you start stitching together a new supply shed, often the elasticity of the balance sheet for these small brands isn't flexible enough that they can actually do all that. And yeah. so it's a really fascinating idea and clever to have um, sort of believer brands, you know, take a portion of their, of their revenues and create like a regenerative um, give back, you know, sort of like a, um, a consumer to farm. Like I think of farm to table and then table to farm, like how do we complete the circle? And so it's really interesting for brands to come up with a, a simple commitment of 1% or something that then can flow back into farmers they know, even if it's outside their supply shed. Mm -hmm. um, but it gives them that ability to understand the farmers, the ability to connect with that story, to actually drive and create real change without doing some of the real heavy lifting stuff where there might not be resources you know, available for that. Um, that's cool. I like that. I, I hadn't connected the dots on how that was happening. And I really like that. Yeah. Well, and then our project this year is, uh, with Bella gluten free again, and they're uh, now pledging 1% to uh, a farmer, a different farmer in Pennsylvania, Lucas Criswell, that is uh, taking one of his cornfields glyphosate free. So he's done a bunch of work on the soil health side, building it up. And, um, he's willing to to take that risk. And again, because he might, he'll probably lose some yield. Uh, he might have some challenges, but he'll have at least a cushion, an economic cushion to kind of help offset that, that risk. And within that field, two of the acres that he's planted are white corn that are going to go to Bella gluten freeze, uh, corn, cornbread mix. Um, and so she will have then in this, in this case, an actual direct link to the product. Um, and they'll do, you know, do glyphosate uh, free testing at the end of the project. But, um, but that's different than just a label of glyphosate free without a connection to the farmer and without an understanding of look, the reason he's able to do this is because of years of work he's put in getting that soil to be so healthy that it can withstand this. Um, and, and frankly, a lot of, a lot of farmers can't do that. Uh, that's, it's not even just a management things, you know, it's, it's a complicated thing, but, um, but we know consumers care about that and farmers would love to be able to get to use less or to get away from it. And so his example will also be something that he will share with other farmers in our network and they'll be able to learn from it and they'll be able to maybe mm -hmm. copy some of the steps that he's, mm -hmm. that he's taking. How do you, how do you go about the, um, the matchmaking process between sort of farmers and supply, supply and demand? Like what's your, is it sort of one off sort of relationships that come out of your community of change? Um, what's your process look like for that kind of matchmaking? Um, that you're, you're doing? Well, it, it starts with what the brand is looking for, what ingredient, you know, they're, they're initially interested in, or if they're not interested in a specific ingredient, you know, what, what's the, the issue that they're most connected to? Is it carbon? Is it pesticides? Mm -hmm. Is it, you know, uh, maybe hopefully it's not all of it at once because, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so that, but then depending on that, just focusing on the crop itself, you know, focuses you on the, the farmers growing that crop, but then um, being able to, kind of, I mean, I, you know, I get to know all of them and that's, that's the really nice thing. So I can see personality issues that I think would be beneficial. I, I can see, um, geographic, you know, connections that would be good. Um, and then also, um, you know, the mindset, the mindset piece. So in this, you know, in this last project, um, and you, you know, working in agriculture, it's very difficult for a conventional farmer to, to go without any glyphosate, you know? Um, and so, that, that was a rare, I knew that was something that Bella was interested in. And so that was a rare opportunity because of how far he'd gone with his soil health. And it, and the project came, you know, talking with him about, well, what, what things could you do? You know, what, what things could we pay for to help you go glyphosate mm -hmm. free? And, you know, and then, then the back and forth and, you know, talking back to Bella about, well, would this be interesting? You know, I kind of think of myself like an old time matchmaker, <laughs> you know, yeah. where you really get to know, both sides. And then you have a basis for saying why I think you guys would be good together. You know? That's great. No, that's really cool. I, 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 you know, another thing that we've been working on in our own experience is just 
the importance of exchange of uh, experience and wisdom among farmers, you know, to have that sort of de-risking of the, you know, of the choice of not using glyphosate. Like how, how do you, um, how do you find the courage and the ability to do that? And so have you worked at all with farmers kind of connecting them to success cases or trying to create a community of change, not only with the brands, but also with the farmers. And so you're sort of having an information and knowledge flow so that that um, risk taking is a little bit more palatable. Yes. I mean, that's one of the most exciting things for me is to watch that happen. Uh, Cause we have, you know, we have, so the overall network, it's kind of like the hotel lobby. And so the consumers and the farmers, everybody can mingle in that. And then we have the builder space, which is a private space, like a room, like a meeting room over there. And only they can talk, only they can see that conversation. And the consumer space, they, they have a space too, where only they you know, can see that space. So in the builder space, um, that's where the farmers talked with each other a lot. And I don't have to, so they are the ones that, they, they're the yeah. ones that know it. Um, but because they have this space, and it's away from the glare of Twitter, frankly, <laughs> which I know a lot of farmers use. They, they share pictures, they share updates. But uh, some, of the, some of the farmers in my network left Twitter because yeah. every time they'd post something, there'd be uh, just a whole group of criticizers. You know, whole, well, why, why'd you do that? Well, I, that's going to fail. It's like just tear it down, tear it down, tear it down. Um, and so in our community, there, there's none of that. I mean, first and foremost, I think it's the kind of people, like I said, that are drawn to us. But we actually have a rule. We have a code of conduct that uh, mm -hmm. you don't attack what other people are doing. And, you know, so um, if you violate that, you, you would be pushed out. Um, and that just having a private space where a lot of other really good farmers are also active. So it's like, it's not, not enough to just have a private space. You also have to have some really great minds that use it. Uh, and, but they do. And so then they learn from each other and they share, you know, they're, they're all in different peer groups. But then our peer group of farmers um, kind of is a melding pot of all these different um, schools awesome. of thought and, 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 so and important. practices. Yeah, it's so important. I mean, the best Facebook groups that aren't toxic, um, as my kids would say, um, <laughs> uh, are really powerful exchanges. I mean, everything cover crops is one example. I'm a member of that group. Um, you know, someone posts something and it's like 29 comments within a half an hour. Yeah. Um, and I have found answers to some really challenging questions um, in these farmer communities. And uh, I find that when um, the farmer communities are limited to producers that are sort of have a sense of sharing the same fate of where they're going in life, mm -hmm. that it tends to be a really healthy conversation um, because they're kind of in the trenches together. And uh, that's really cool that internally you're doing that with your network. You're kind of leveraging all that social capital and the best way to get everyone sort of moving forward faster. Um, what, what kind of energy do you, are you finding on the ground and in brands to really commit to regenerative ag and, and how is that, how are those commitments taking shape? I mean, is it more, is it money on the table? Is it like a four X premium? Um, like who's knocking on your door the most? Do you see that those things are like, working in lockstep, you have brands and farmers kind of both really revving up or what's the energy? Yeah, I really wish I could say I had brands knocking on my door. Um, I, you know, initially I reached out to like 500 brands, small emerging brands, or I thought they were kind of emerging, but you know, they were the kind of brands that will be showing at, at uh, Expo East and Expo West, the natural products trade shows. And uh, so they're in that zone and they, you know, they're going after that customer base. And I thought, you know, this will make perfect sense. And I would go to uh, conferences about regenerative agriculture and summits and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and at the epicenter as, you know, their regenerative Earth summit. And, uh, and I would see, you know, all these brands talking about how they want it. They really want it. Where, where is it? You know, but when I reach out to them, they go right back to the exact sourcing model that exists and they just want like a regenerative label on top of it, which, you know, I, you can't blame them. I mean, they're, they're used to the infrastructure and the system that they have. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think when we, back when we were talking about the mission of grounded growth, I had to expand it. Initially, I just wanted to expand regenerative agriculture, but in order to do that, you have to sort of regenerate the whole thing, you know, because yeah. regenerative agriculture can't come to scale through, a, through the existing system. I mean, I just don't believe that it, that it can because once you lose the connection to the farmer who did it, you lose the mindset, you lose the complexity, you lose the nuance, you lose the, well, you'll know it when you see it. Well, if you can't see it, how, <laughs> so 
but I had to learn that, you know, over a hard two years. So I think that the, the, the flip side of that is if you, if you do keep those things together and you help some of these brands succeed, then other food companies will follow. So I have shifted my, my strategy from, um, I'm frank, I'm frankly not going, I mean, I would love for more brands to join us. I, don't get me wrong. I would, but I am not going after and pestering and being one of the 10 emails that they ignore anymore. Um, what we are focusing on is the three, you know, brand partners that we have that are not only, um, actively working on projects to bring ingredients to, to take crop to ingredient into their, uh, products, but the big breakthrough. And again, this came from discussions with them, uh, is, that those brands are going to sell the ingredients to other brands. So, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time having to build the supply chain for them, but then they become the output. So they'll be wholesale sellers of oh, ingredients exactly. to Perfect. other small brands. And so then the, then the thing I can do the outreach on is, Hey, don't you want some regenerative wheat flour? You can buy it from yeah. <laughs> around the world gourmet or, you know, what about some regenerative rice flour? you know, you can like that, corn, yeah. cornmeal, you know, so, um, it, it puts it closer to a form that they can accept. And yeah, that's, again, yeah. you have to meet people where they are, you know, we're going to rebuild a supply chain for these small brands, but we, you can't custom that customize that for every brand out there. The other big, uh, breakthrough for me is realizing that I needed to find brands earlier in their, in their, uh, formation. And so where I've had some really exciting success and, and see movement is brands that are just starting to put their product supply chain together. And so they're looking at the choices in front of them are, you know, organic ingredients that are very expensive. Well, if there's a direct supply chain connection, uh, they can maybe cut that cost and then they could embed regenerative in their brand from the beginning and go that, you know, go that direction. So, um, those are our pathways to, to market, but they, that isn't what I thought. And it's not what I wanted. <laughs> I wanted, you know, to just scoop in 500 brands and let's pair you up with farmers and let, you know, uh, yeah. but it was too much. It was too much for them, you know, so we had to take a different direction. Yeah. I mean, I think that speaks to sort of more of like a, a breadth versus depth sort of strategy doing you know, we, we've, we've struggled with this kind of um, tension a little bit as well as an organization where um, we believe that, you know, a regenerative, a regenerative operation, whether it's a farm or a, an aggregator or distributor needs to function 10x better than anything around it in order to create an attractor for change. And when it is operating at 10x better, the, the revolution will be inevitable um, because people will landslide into it because happiness, joy, prosperity will all be wrapped up in the same manifestation of right, you know, right living with the land and community. And I like that depth approach. We, we've um, put a lot of tendrils out early on to kind of discover who we are. And as we continue to discover who we are, I think these sort of investing in these um, true believers that are doing the right thing out the gates makes a lot of sense. And I think there's a lot of great um, a track record of those types of people doing really well. I think of like Grain Place Foods that Dave Vetter runs, very much that, you know, he has a whole network of 60 farmers, creates a really incredible supply, and then many, many small brands, you know, use him as an early co-packer and brand. Like I think of someone like him or, you know, Timeless Seeds with David Oyn and that team. And, you know, the, I don't know, I think, I think it's a really cool model that's finding traction too. I think of all like the re-regionally, you know, the re-regionalizing of the commodity landscape with, you know, Anson Mills and Bluebird Mills and Hayden and Karen Springs and Camas Country and Barton Springs. Like there's such a, a powerful sort of revival happening around sort of rural grains and infrastructure. Um, I mean, we're just at the very tip of that, but what you're describing sounds like it's very much in that kind of cultural awakening. And uh, yeah, it's exciting. It's very cool. Um, let me see. Uh, we're getting close to the end of our time together. Um, I guess I would just ask you a couple last questions. What's sort of next for your team, for you? What's on the horizon? Um, where do you, I mean, we just sort of covered that a little bit with your sort of change of strategy and where you're focusing. Um, but is there anything that's kind of on the horizon that's exciting you, where you're going to be putting your energy and time um, in the near future? Yeah, I mean, the, the most exciting thing and where I, I see putting a lot of energy and I see ground growth really 
growing into is this consumer side. Uh, because I, I would go to trade shows and I would have people come up to me and say, you know, you should have a consumer membership because I've just learned that, you know, X wasn't what I thought. And, you know, and so we, we really, it took a while to kind of formulate and re, you know, re, redo the platform to be able to keep the privacy and the connection of the original group and yet add in. And so, you know, we've done that now. And now that we have, uh, I see um, a lot of the, the projects are going and they'll, they'll keep going. But because we've changed our strategy, we're not going to really be focusing on starting a bunch of new supply chain projects. I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to maximize the output from the, the brands that we have. And so we will get to scale there, but it's, it's a different um, path. And so I can put my, my energy into really helping consumers, you know, learn about this and learn about, learn about it from the people who are doing it right now and ideally who become loyal consumers for them. And, you know, because we have a monthly call with our consumers, like we do with our, with our builders. And, uh, I bring, I invite our builders over to interview is with the consumer. So in what world do you as just a random consumer get to one month and you hear from a farmer that's doing regenerative and asking it, and it's also building a mill on his farm and add seed cleaning. And, you know, it's, he's you know going to be able to make his own flower. Uh, and you can ask him questions about it and see it, you know, in the background. Uh, and then the next month you hear from a, a food company that's, you know, you know, adding in this whole farmer supply chain piece and ask them questions about, well, why don't other brands do it? And well, what about this? And, you know, so they're going to be able to really learn from and become part of the demand side that, um, you know, that, and then that's why more small brands will do it. The farmer side is there. I mean, I, you know, we get farmers, um, reaching out to us all the time. And the only thing I think holding some of them back from joining is that we just don't have a lot of ready to go markets to plug them into. And so there's a, there's a mindset thing on the farm side too, that like they're used to, okay, I'm ready to go. Where, where is it? You know, and I have to say to all sides, look, we are building it. That's why we called it the builder circle. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> exist. You can't just show up and type in, you know, like a commodity, you know, market, type in your bid and your offer and you're, you know, off to the races. No, it's a lot, it's a lot harder than that at first, but there's a lot bigger payoff uh, over time. Yeah. No, that's, that's great to hear. Um, sorry, I'm going to end this. Okay. <laughs> I shouldn't have my phone connected to my uh, computer, but it is. Um, yeah. So, you know, the one thing that I uh, would like to maybe wrap up on is that, you know, we've, sort of, uh, I think, two, two energies. One is, is we live in extraordinary times um, in a global pandemic. Um, recent events with George Floyd's death um, exposing, um, you know, the structure of racism and in, in all of our lives that really characterize the systems we live in. And, and I'm just curious how these events are affecting your work, your approach and perspective. Um, how this new consciousness that I think is arising in many of us is, you know, what, what, how's it, how's it impacting you, your, your work? And then I would say, you know, how is it also giving you, where giving you hope and possibility for what I think of as like whole regeneration. I mean, whole regeneration extends well beyond the land, but, you know, healing to ourselves, healing, you know, to others in our community, um, healing with the earth. And so I'm just curious to, to hear from you how these, these kind of extraordinary times and these exposures of some of the ills of society are also maybe giving rise to a very hopeful, creative uh, process to building something new and more regenerative. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a tough, uh, tough topic, tough time. Um, I have, um, I have been really moved by, I'm part of a Bible study group and I live in a, a majority African-American city um, the, the city council is all black, the, the police force, everything, you know, everything. And, um, one of the things that struck me is, and every place is different, of course, but, um, again, what I'm seeing from the news, what I'm seeing from the, from the media is just totally different than, than what I live in my life. I mean, I'm, I'm, ex I was expecting, I don't know what I was expecting, not good <laughs> going mm -hmm. to the grocery store or going, you know, um, but it's been nothing but good. There's been friendliness and kindness, um, here and, um, and that's been wonderful to see. And it's, um, 
you know, I am integrated in my life. I think some of this comes from like our neighbors and, you know, our Bible study. And uh, I think a lot of this misunderstanding and, and uh, tragedy comes from people not being integrated and, and not, you know, even in their, in their mindset, they may think they are in their mindset. They may, it's back to that monoculture thing. I, I think all the right thoughts, you know, but <laughs> well, how are you living in your life? Um, and so for me, living in an integrated diverse way has been a shelter uh, from some of the storm I think that's that's out there um, but certainly my faith has too and I you know I see recreated in a secular way um, a lot of the uh, the the harsh side of religion the judgment the mm -hmm. condemnation the you know mm -hmm. uh, but I don't see the forgiveness side <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't see that the transformative um, saving grace side. Um, and so, um, I think that without that, you won't have, you won't have real change. I mean, if all you want to do is, is just change which group you now think is superior and, um, and shame other people for their skin color that they can't help either. Um, that that's not, that's not regenerating. That's not healing. That's not, you know, that's sort of in, in, in an agricultural sense, I think that's just, Again, going back to a certain practice that one practice may look good in, in a vacuum, but nature doesn't happen in a vacuum. In fact, nature abhors a vacuum. It fills it in. You know, so um, I guess it's a hard, hard link to make, but I, I think anything, that, an energy that comes from condemnation and negativity and anger, um, back to the theory of change, that doesn't change. It doesn't change people. It hardens people. It pushes people back in the direction you supposedly don't want them to go. Um, so if we are going to be interested in, in healing, which uh, to me, that's what regenerative is all about, regenerating the land, regenerating the, the business relationships between people, uh, the connection back to the consumer. It's all about healing, regenerating. And if we want to do that uh, with each other, you know, whether it's across politics or across race, then the energy we come from and start with is a huge, um, makes a huge difference. I think that's a great note to wrap up on. Um, just for the audience, um, I'm Phil Taylor, founder of Mad Agriculture and guest host of At the Epicenter's Regenerative Voices, Elevating Stories, Activating Change podcast. And uh, Sarah Harper and I just had a wonderful conversation. Uh, she is the founder and CEO of Grounded Growth, working toward regeneration at home and globally. Um, I appreciate the conversation. I look forward to connecting you um, with you in the near future. Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. The Regenerative Voices Elevating Stories Activating Change podcast series is produced by At the Epicenter, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. Make a tax-deductible donation or sign up as a monthly supporter by visiting at theepicenter.com slash donate. Support packages start at $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. To become a podcast sponsor, visit at theepicenter.com slash contact to let us know of your interest. If you found this podcast episode insightful and meaningful, please pass it on by sharing it with a friend or colleague who will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in, for your support, and for activating change.